grace to be humble. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. The cherub or the cherubims are a class of angels that the Lord has created, appointed to protect His holiness from intruders on earth. This cherub will a flaming sword after Adam and Eve fell at the garden so that they would not have access to the tree of life by which they would, if they partake, would continue in their state of sin in an everlasting manner. And so God sends the cherubim with a flaming sword in order that there would be no intruders who would partake of that tree of life after the fall of Adam and Eve. And the cherub is also the guardians of God's presence or God's holiness uh, against intruders. In the entrance to the tabernacle, you see that the cherub is woven into the fabric of the curtains uh, to give us a picture of the protective presence of God uh, and how uh, he sends this anointed cherub with his authority to destroy those who would desecrate his holy place. Lucifer or Satan Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us was an anointed cherub. Lucifer was the most beautiful, we may say, of archangels that God had created until sin was found in his heart by five thoughts, prideful thoughts in his heart. Lucifer, the bearer of light, that's the meaning of the word, was cast down from heaven and he came as the serpent to tempt Adam and Eve and saying to them that if you would eat of this fruit that God had said don't eat for in the eating of it you would surely die you would find yourself filled with wisdom filled with great understanding and great anointing Wow, Adam and Eve could not resist the temptation of being able to come, go out of God's purview, under God's authority. And they took of the fruit and they fell and thereby Death came upon this world. And if you read the Genesis account, it's very interesting that the first men and women lived to 800 years, 900 years. How, when Adam and Eve was created, God gave them the opportunity to name all the animals in the animal kingdom. Did men or did men come uh, in the original times living in caves? Well, if we read the Genesis account, we would realize that they were very intelligent and God uh, gave them the strength right, to live for a very, very long time. The deterioration of men since the fall, when sin entered in, the first sin was a sin of pride. It is said that sin of pride is the ground in which all other sin grow and the parent from which all other sins come. Proverbs 16, 18 
tells us. Pride goeth before destruction. And a haughty spirit, or an haughty spirit, before a fall. It was the sin of pride, the haughty spirit, that caused the most beautiful and perfect of God's creature, the anointed cherub, Satan, or Lucifer, to fall. And it is so sad to see how sin came upon mankind and the destruction that came upon mankind. And so, in order to redeem fallen men, God had to provide a way out. And He sent His only begotten Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The personification of God Himself and how our Lord lived a life of humility, a life of meekness. He came as a suffering servant, a totally different life from uh, the life of men in this world, a totally different philosophy, a totally different understanding outlook of interaction between men. And Peter is saying to us here in this text how important it is that we would bear this fruit of grace in our lives, that God would grant us that grace to be humble and the grace to the humble. Three thoughts. Verse 5, bear the spiritual fruit of submission. And verse 6, humble yourselves. Allow yourself to be humbled. Humble yourselves. This is a command that God gives us in verse 6. Humble ourselves. A very different uh, command that God gives us from what others would tell us in the causes of this world. And thirdly, in verse 7, trusting the Lord's care. Verse 7. And the first thought that we would like to think about in verse 5, bear the spiritual fruit of submission. So in the church of God, there is an order by which there is great harmony and peace amongst its members. Verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility, then the word there means a lowliness of mind. For God resisteth the proud. He giveth grace to the humble. God resisteth the proud. The word there means God opposes the proud. God is against that proud spirit. And so here, the thought that is given before us is to consider how we are to submit first to the elder. Well, here it speaks about uh, someone who is older in age to you. Uh, we live in an age where, whereby authority is spurned from the home to the workplace to society at large. And there is great chaos when there is no order in any organization. And so, in the living organism of the church, the Lord says to the younger, submit yourselves 
to those who are older. Here, it is a spiritual grace that tells us right, to <clears throat> humble ourselves, that we <clears throat> may practice this particular active humility in our lives so that we may be able to allow God's way to prevail in the home, parents and children. Children are asked to obey their parents. Children are to obey the instruction of the parents because the parents have a responsibility for the care of the child. And so, for the good of the child, the child is instructed to obey their parents. Honour thy father and thy mother. The authority in the home, the authority in the church. The Lord Jesus Christ says to us, and... <clears throat> The book of Hebrews puts it well. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they, they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Hebrews 13 verse 7. For the order in the church how important it is that we would have that grace in our heart, a humble spirit in our heart to listen and to obey and to follow. How important it is that, that such a grace would be developed in the lives of God's children. And so Peter says, likewise, he said earlier in verses 1 to 4, how the <clears throat> shepherd that God has appointed is to care for the sheep with their own lives. And here is given uh, injunction to those who are younger and also an injunction to one another. You see here there are three uh, particular submission that is being given here in verse 5. Submission to the elder, submission one to another, and <clears throat> submission to God. God resisteth the proud, and he giveth grace to the humble. And so here, uh, the exhortation is that we uh, would bear the fruit, the spiritual fruit of submission in our lives. We may learn how to be subjected, right? uh, and here, one to another, uh, to be clothed with a... Uh, disposition of humility. Our Lord Jesus says, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You remember what was the first thing that the Lord speak about when he came upon earth? 30 years silence. When he began his ministry, he began with these words in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. First thing that God gave, or Jesus gave, is the way of blessing. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. To know ourselves undone, to know ourselves inadequate in, that, in, the, in the very sense of the word, that we are sinners, that we are not worthy in the sight of God. And therefore the Lord says to us how important it is that we would put on this spirit, this act, action of meekness and lowliness. Jesus says, ye will find rest unto your souls. And so for the Christian, the Lord tells us that humility is a part of the Christian mindset and that he wants us to have this mindset. So Paul says in Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. How important it is that there is such a mindset in the people of God. Humility is a virtue that God places in the lives of His people of great importance. And the opposite of it is pride, a haughty spirit. And so the Lord tells us how we need to bear that spirit of humility, a lowliness of mind. And the Lord gives us this injunction in order that we may uh, understand right, how order in his kingdom can prevail, must prevail through a different kind of spirit. And so, you know, if you begin serving, you would begin, we said, uh, interacting one with another. And how important it is in our service that we would be able to exercise this spiritual virtue of humility in our hearts. And here the Lord says, humble yourself. Humble yourselves. And it's a command. Right? Humble yourselves. How important it is that we would allow ourselves to be under the auspices, the authority of God in our hearts, in our lives. Only when we are able to do so, ah, you find that there is rest that comes to our soul. And so the Lord speaks to us and uh, uh, causes us uh, to learn how we need to humble ourselves. In the time of the divided kingdom, there was a king by the name of Manasseh. Manasseh was one of those very wicked kings who ruled for a long time, if I'm not wrong, at least 50 years, 55 years he ruled. And he did all sorts of abominable things. And, you know, uh, he was so wayward uh, that the, the Lord had to send a great uh, chastisement, in, an enemy. And Second Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 11 to 30 describes for us that account in Manasseh's life. It says here, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them, the people of Judah, the captains of the hosts of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. 
And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And it was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. When he acted in a very wanton way, imbibing, bringing in the gods of the land, there was great chaos in Israel. And in his pride, he could not see. And God had to show him. And that came through the hand of the Babylonians. Frightening, cruel enemies. And, but we see how he humbled himself. The Lord said that he humbled himself greatly in his affliction. Sometimes God allows us to go through afflictions so that we may see and understand where we have gone wrong. Manasseh was one such person and how he, there is a way back with God. Right? As you read, that, read his life and all those wicked things that he did and how he humbled himself and how God provided a way back for him. He was brought back to Jerusalem again. The Lord says, the Bible tells us how the Lord heard his supplication. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. In other words, Manasseh understood that his God cares for him that his God is a great God. His God is the only living and true God. No other. So as you think about human history, 7,000 years, why did God allow us to go through such uh, chaotic, you say, tragic, um, terrible uh, history? In the last century, we thought that there would, there would be peace, but we had two great world wars. And after the world wars, there were many wars that were fought. Many wars. And someone said that those times when there was no war, everyone was reloading, preparing for the next. Well, that's human society. Great chaos. Right? You punch me, I will punch you back harder. That's the way of the world. And the Lord had to help us to see uh, there is a better way. How we just are unable to find and seek a way of true peace. That's why Jesus, God himself, had to come upon earth, you know, to show us a better way. And so our Lord Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, come and believe. Come and believe the truth concerning what God's has planned for the salvation of your soul, to give you true peace in your heart, to give you true joy in your heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God's way versus our way how important it is that the people of God must learn. And if we would 
humble ourselves under God's leading? Would God not take care of us and help us? Uh, one great example is the Exodus. Remember? Israel was under bondage. They were slaves in Egypt. And bondage was terrible. They were working many hours without proper medical care, without proper welfare, without proper equipment. And they cry out to their God. They were serving the God of this world. The God of this world, Pharaoh himself, and how that yoke was so terrible. They cried out to God, and God brought them out. And when they were out, what happened? They got, God brought them to the wilderness, and they asked themselves, God, why did you bring us out of Egypt? and bring us to a wilderness. Well, it was there in the wilderness that they experienced the presence of God with them, the power of God protecting them. When everything is stripped away or stripped out from us, taken away from us, then we would have a right focus, just like Manasseh. Everything was... He was king, you know. God took everything away from him and he was in the dungeon dying and there he realised that his God the God whom his fathers have left for him in the scriptures is the living and true God and so he humbled himself and come to him and so the Lord teaches us and says to us that we are to submit and live under the blessed auspices of God and one another. How, imp- how blessed it is when Adam and Eve was in the garden. The Lord was with them. Right? The Bible tells us in the cool of the garden, the Lord was walking with them. They had the Lord's presence with them. And God created a most beautiful paradise for them. The presence of God with us. Do you realize it? And the Lord wants us to live in that blessing of His authority and His presence with us. Now, what was Peter, who were Peter speaking to? He was speaking to suffering, persecuted, impoverished Christians. Those who are crying, those who are in trouble, those who are persecuted in many ways. And Peter is saying to them how they need to realize the way of God is the best way. The way of God's instruction is the best way. And he seeks for us to follow it. And so, humble yourselves, Peter says, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exhort you in due time. In other words, he tells us that a time will come when God will bring you out of your trial. Our Lord Jesus Christ is returning again. And he has given us this yoke of this present life. And we are to live it to the fullest and we are to live it to the utmost for him. And, you know, God brought us to worship him and provided for us a place of worship. And it's interesting that this place of worship reminds us 
of the days of Noah, of the judgment of God in the global flood, and how the Lord is coming again a second time, and how important it is that the people of God need to realize that when the Lord comes, all our labors are over. Reward for eternity will come. And so he's saying to us that if you have understood the grace of God has come upon you and that you have understood the will of God, then let us put our hearts and minds, our soul and strength behind this effort to announce to the world of the Lord's coming again, that true peace will come, true joy will come. There is a time of consummation. And so uh, the Lord speaks to the people of God and said that, while we are going through trials, while we are afflicted, he says to us that we are to humble ourselves, allow ourselves to go through the hardship, go through the affliction, go through the test that God would bring before us. And he says that in his appointed time, in his wisdom, there will be relief, there will be reward. The Lord will make a way out for you. And so the Lord says to us that while you follow the Lord, like the Israelites going through the wilderness, you have any need? Let the Lord know. That's verse 7. Trusting the Lord's care as you follow Him, as you live under His purview, he says to us, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He says to us that if you have any need, you are in any trouble, tell it to the Lord, for you have a God who truly cares for you. Don't go other way. Don't take the easy way out. Manasseh learned it the hard way. He went the other direction and he sped along in the other direction so vehemently so wantonly until he was rudely awakened and stopped and the Lord turned him back and how happy it is to be living with God. And so when the Israelites realized that God was there with them, you know, they would not complain that they are eating manna every day. Uh, same food from heaven every day. So they said, Ah, yeah, Egypt, we have leeks, we have onions. But here in the wilderness, we have nothing. Well, the Lord is saying to us that we have to learn to live in the presence of the sufficiency of God in our lives. That's the best. Where was God bringing them? To the promised land. Where is God bringing us? To the glories of heaven. And when heaven comes, 
you know, you won't regret it. We know we won't regret it. The Word of God tells us we won't regret it. And therefore, while we are here, you may be under some stress, some distress, some yoke. The Lord says to us that He will take care of you. Don't be discouraged. Casting all your care upon Him. Would you be willing to put your trust in the Lord? To <clears throat> the, the word there means to, to throw. To cast means to throw. To give to the Lord your troubles. Don't take them back. Let the Lord handle. And the Lord is seeking for us to live such a life. Such a life of dependence. That's humility. Uh, that's the definition of humility. To be dependent on God. And in that sense, to be dependent one upon another. We need one another. We serve one another. We love one another. And so the Lord says to us that we are to trust in His care. We are to allow Him right, to... Uh, prove himself worthy. And, you know, God doesn't fail us. He never fails. He's faithful. Faithfulness is the greatest character of God. Faithfulness. No shadow of turning. God is faithful. Jesus says, not one hair of your head will fall without your Father's knowledge. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Do you realize that? How precious you are in the sight of God? How great uh, a salvation that He has given to you? And if we have understood it, then we would obey the Lord's instruction. Israel would have hearkened to Joshua and Caleb when the Lord brought back the two spies to say, this is a land that is filled with milk and honey. I've carried back the grapes, a land worthy for us to enter. Let us enter in. But what did the other ten spies say? There were giants in the land. Very fearful. We won't survive. It's true, there were giants in the land. Goliath was very tall. But the Lord said that they will have the victory. Did Israel obey? Well, they did not. They did not enter the promised land at the appointed time, only 40 years later. The entire generation of those that disobeyed died. And the Lord brought a new generation. How important it is that we experience the sufficiency of God in our lives. Live that life of dependence. Bear the spiritual fruit of submission, verse 5. Humble yourselves. And verse 6, trusting the Lord's care. Has the Lord lay upon you 
the burden of doing something for the souls of men that is dying, well, may God lay that burden in our heart and let it be so real that we would be willing to do that for his own honour and glory to serve him may God help us that we may learn the grace of humility that dependence upon God so that we may be a vessel that would be fit for the master's use when we are ready well the Lord would bring the people into our lives so may we prepare ourselves and undergird ourselves with his with all the instructions that he has given us so that we would bear the character of the person of God in Christ, that we may be fruitful in our life for his own honour and glory. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy word. Thank thee for thy mercy in granting to us the understanding of how we need to submit ourselves to Thee and to one another, to the authorities that Thou hast placed in our lives. Father, we pray that Thou bless Thy people and grant that there will be uh, great dependence, a fully surrendered life that you may use for your own honour and glory. Help us, Lord, as we submit ourselves to thee for thy own honour and glory and to one another for thy own honour and glory. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.